8 p.m. <laughs> away from the sun, winter shadows begin to stretch out across the North Country. Each day, less sunlight and less solar energy reach the land. Moisture falling through the cold air freezes into a crystalline comforter, covering the earth, tucking it in for a long winter's nap. Most forms of life respond to this role of the planet by slowing down conserving what little energy remains. Sap slips down into the roots of trees, beginning the long wait until spring's uprisings. Life seems to be silently settling into winter. But there is a creature whose season just begins with the first snowfall, whose life brightens into the low winter sun. This is the Alaskan sled dog, a husky who has anticipated the changing season since the first frosty nights of August. These sled dogs are not house pets. They are working animals and they work hard for their living. And they love their work. Sled dogs are creatures of the snow and the cold and the moonlight. Hours ago, two other creatures arose to share that snow and that cold and that moonlight. Like my dogs, I too love winter best. Most mushers do. Why else would we choose to live on the 64th parallel where winter rules from October through April? I love starting out my day by going out and making the rounds of the dog yard. Wake up, guys. Here comes. My dogs take good care of me, and I try to take good care of them. I give them plenty of food, water, and TLC, and for me, that works. Every musher has a different way of relating to his or her dogs. These dogs are some of my best friends. We spend many hours a day on the trail together. For me, it makes sense to share that time with good friends. Take my friend here, little Joe. He's one of my favorites. Uh, but then again, I have 13 favorites, each for a different reason. Little Joe is a mixed-breed husky, bred more for his working qualities than for show. Most sled dogs are not purebred dogs, but a conglomeration of bloodlines constantly evolving to fill the demands of the mushers who breed them. Little Joe is a large freighting dog. He weighs about 90 pounds. He has just the build I'm looking for in sled dogs, long legs and a rangy body. In deep snow, Joe's the dog to have breaking trail. Joe's feet are compact. The toes fit neatly together with stiff, bristly hair between them. Little Joe has a dense double coat with stiff guard hairs and a soft downy undercoat. This combination protects him even at 60 below zero. But Little Joe's most impressive quality is his spirit, his intense desire to work hard pulling the sled. Big Joe, Little Joe's father, had that same desire. He'd work his heart out for you. Good attitude is the most important trait to select for in breeding sled dogs. Here's Nellie, the mother dog of my kennels. Nellie is a lead dog when she's not doing time in the pen. The puppy pen, that is. 
Last fall, she had two little pups, and what that litter lacked in number, the two pups made up for in size. They stayed warm near Nellie, and I loved to watch them snuggle up, grunting their little contented moans. With milk enough to feed eight pups, these two were little porkers, little blimps. In just a few weeks, they had tripled in size and were a little more adventuresome. One sad morning, I found the male pup dead in his home. He seemed so healthy, I can't imagine what killed him. I sure missed him, and so did his sister, which I named Solo, because now she was all alone. At three months, Sola was eager to follow her mom down new trails. Did she have an inkling of what her life as a sled dog would hold? By four months, she was fast enough to follow the team, but Solo had visions of being a lead dog. A hundred yards down the trail, she was back where she belonged. Puppies tire out quickly, so I loaded her in the sled and gave her a ride. We'll just snap you on there so you can't fall off. Come out. Stay in. Next, I put a harness on Solo and let her get the feel of pulling something. Her friends back at the dog yard cheer her on. Once I put her in the team next to Nellie. I think Solo liked being up in front of the sled with the big dogs. Later in the spring, I put her up in the head of the team. Maybe she will turn out to be a lead dog. This curious canine is my biggest dog and the funniest. Sometimes I get the feeling he thinks he's in the team of Sergeant Preston of the Yukon and, and I don't have the heart to tell him otherwise. As a matter of fact, Jack reminds me of some of the old-time dogs bred back at the turn of the century. These dogs were heftier than the Siberian breeds used by the Eskimos. Many mushers today prefer smaller dogs, 40, 50 pounds, but I like the big dogs like Jack. Explorers and traders opened up the north for their dog teams. The Hudson Bay Company brought the world's demand for fur to the north, and native trappers enlarged their trap lines with the help of their dog teams. Trappers also brought their furs to the trading posts with these teams. The Royal Northwest Mounted Police depended on dogs to run their patrols to keep justice in the north, as every Sergeant Preston fan well knows. During the gold rush, all winter supplies were hauled by dogs. 
food, clothing, building supplies, gold, mail, and even passengers. Everything relied on the dog team until spring breakup allowed boats to ply the rivers. Judges and clergymen traveled the north by dogs, bringing law and order and religion to the people. And where there's two dog teams, of course, there's going to be a race. And today, dog teams are still opening up new worlds for people. Our dogs have allowed us to live out some of our dreams. We wanted to build a cabin in the woods and learn what that life had to teach. For two people from the suburbs of Milwaukee, this was quite a change, quite a challenge, quite an adventure. The dogs made it possible to live here in this peaceful forest about 30 miles from Fairbanks. They skidded in the heavy green spruce logs that John would craft into the walls of a house. As the rounds of logs grew higher, our hearts knew that this was the right place. We worked long days as the forest shook off the mantle of winter and relaxed into spring. The next summer, we returned with some friends and put on the sod roof. Again, the dogs helped transport the hundred-pound clumps of moss and earth. In early winter, when the first snow softened the trail, the dogs freighted in the finishing touches for the cabin. The windows, the 500-pound cook stove, the treadle sewing machine, and the old earthenware crocks my grandmother used to use back on the farm in Wisconsin. And to this day, the dogs still pull in supplies to fill those crocks. The cash, the root cellar, and the dog food barrels. The dogs pull in 50 gallons of water in a single trip from the creek. And that's the coldest, freshest water in the world. It flows out of the ground about 30 feet above the water hole, so we don't have to worry about pollution or parasites. Now that's what I call running water. And there's always firewood to bring into the woodshed. We fill it up each spring so the wood is under cover over the summer. Green birch takes two years to dry out after it's split. And we use the dry, dead spruce for the cook stove. There's a warm, secure feeling in knowing the cabin will be snug and cozy no matter how low the temperature dips. with the dogs in our chores is an integral part of living here. They are eager helpers and they have a natural desire to please. They love their work. But every once in a while I have a little trouble with that black dog right there behind the leader. That's Misty. It's not that Misty is really lazy. I guess she just remembers another life. You see, I gave Misty away as a pet when she was six weeks old. A year later, her owners were leaving town, 
and they gave Misty back to me. I harnessed her up with the team, and she fit in well. But she's sort of a tourist sometimes. She's just going along to see new country. But she comes through in a pinch. She even pulled the team across the finish line one year in the thousand-mile Yukon Quest sled dog race. So Misty's earned a place in my heart, as well as my team. To build a home with our hands and the resources of the woods around us, to fetch our own water, gather our own firewood, search for the bright berries in late summer, and a fat, careless moose in the fall, this life has lessons to teach. The dogs do a lot of work for us, but in our turn, we do a lot of work for the dogs. The team is a 365 day a year responsibility, and they deserve the best care we can give them. Just like the rest of us, the dogs need food, water, shelter, exercise, and attention. Buying the dog food is a major expense, running about a dollar a day a dog. We buy dog food by the ton, some years using commercially prepared feed, and other years cooking ground barley to mix with fish meal and fat. to get to share dog sledding with you. I've lived in Alaska for 20 Just like years. everyone else, we Alaskans have to work for our living. My team and I work with the Riverboat Discovery in the summer, sharing dog sledding with visitors to Fairbanks. I really enjoy meeting people from all around the world. The dogs love the attention and the activity. You might be a musher when you grow up. We have a whole team of these guys. In this way, we earn our living for the rest of the year. Now, my favorite dog chore is distributing fresh hay to all the dog houses. The dogs love the sweet dry grass and they can hardly wait to get in to investigate the new additions to their nest. The sweet aroma must be intoxicating to creatures with such a keen sense of smell. And of course, there's another important daily chore, cleaning up the dog yard. This is not so bad when I take time to play with each dog as I make my rounds. Oh, I almost forgot the most important responsibility of owning a dog team. Here, you guys, you want to go? You want to go for a run? Why don't you go for a run with me? We must run the dogs every day. First of all, you need a responsive, intelligent, dependable, level-headed lead dog. That schnitzel, he's my number one leader. He seems to enjoy the responsibility of being the leader. Some dogs don't. I give each dog the opportunity to try running up in front of the team. The two dogs directly behind the leaders are called swing dogs. They help swing the team around corners. This is also a good place to train future lead dogs. The rest of the dogs are called team dogs, with the exception of the two dogs directly in front of the sled. These are wheel dogs, and they really work hard to pull the sled around tight corners. After the team is all harnessed up, I don't linger. I pull the slip knot, and we're off. Mary Shields is off, and we're out. Seven teams from Canada, Alaska, and the lower 48 states are waiting for the countdown to begin the 1,000-mile Yukon Quest International Sled Dog Race, a cross-country odyssey stretching from Fairbanks, Alaska, to Whitehorse, Yukon Territory, Canada.
It is said, a journey of a thousand miles must begin with a single step. Well, I took that step as I finished my last Yukon quest, when I decided to race again. And preparing for a race like this is a year-long proposition. The blue sky and green leaves of summer are only a distant memory now, but I'm grateful I can earn my living and money for race expenses working with the dogs all summer long. Got a few more miles than I care to remember. Most of the time... It's tough sledding on the gravel, but better than no sledding at all. As the summer fades to early autumn, about mid-August, the nightly temperatures fall with the setting sun. The dogs sense a change coming and they seem energized by the cool air. It must be autumn because uproar goes crazy when he's let loose. He zooms around the dog yard. Perhaps he's looking for a snowy trail. With the first snowfall, we hit the trail. But to avoid hitting it literally, I run with a small team, just three or four dogs. As the snow deepens, the trails soften and the team expands by a dog or two or four. And the distance we run also increases. Eight, 15, 20, 40 miles a day. We'll log some 1,500 miles before the race in February. Some dogs have the enthusiasm to run 1,000 miles, but there's more to racing than just running. Flopsy's a young dog who needs to learn several important lessons before she's ready to race. First of all, she must learn to drink before her water freezes solid. To encourage her, I add dog food to her water, but it doesn't always work. Second, she must learn to rest in harness and not chew on the lines. Finally, Flopsy must learn to wear booties. Dogs don't like things strapped on their feet, so it's important to make this introduction before the race. Booties are used to protect the dog's tender pads from rough trail conditions, and with proper care, sore feet can actually heal on the trail. During a long-distance race, a dog musher will use anywhere from 600 to 1,000 booties. To pay for things like booties, most mushers seek sponsors to help support their race effort. In December, sunlight is a precious commodity in interior Alaska. On December 21st, the winter solstice, we get about four hours of daylight. Hardly enough time to do all that needs to be done before the big race. late January, panic sets in. Sometimes I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, scheming about some aspect of the race. There's nothing else to do but get up and go to work on the new idea, at least on paper. I hope I have hope enough I have dog food dog sent out. I don't want those guys to get hungry, hungry out, there. out there. 160, 160 pounds, pounds to Dawson. To Dawson. Dawson. No, I'm going to no, need, need more for that long stretch. Long stretch. 290 miles. But then a new idea starts working on me. Why, Why am, I am I doing, doing this? this? Well, it's like this. Some people escape to a tropical island. My idea of paradise is the dog trail. I like the adventure of a thousand mile wilderness trek. Oh sure, I'm too tired and too cold to really experience the country with all my senses but there's a basic contentment in being there. The misery, it's expected. All the rest that comes along, that's a surprise. And the biggest surprise is suddenly waking up and it's the morning of the race. It's time to load the dogs in their truck and head downtown to Fairbanks. 
The dogs jump into the truck as they've done before, not knowing they'll run a thousand miles before they see that truck again. As we wait for our starting number to be called, the veterans on the team seem to remember the excitement. But the young dogs, the rookies, they're all wide-eyed and excited. Me too. Yeah, Mary's smiling already. She's having a good time down there. Dogs are all rare to go. Some of hers look pretty calm. Five, four, three, two, one. Go, Mary. Mary is off on the 1988 club. we're out of town, we're feeling a lot more comfortable. The dogs look good. I'm beginning to relax. No more lists, no more errands. We either have it with us, or we don't. Come on, Schnitzel. Take it easy, Flopsy. We got a long way to go. Easy does it, Flopsy. Old Schnitzel seems to remember every mile of the trail. He's setting a reasonable pace. He knows. day or two the team spread out the serious competitors make their move and the race is on out there on the long trail let me tell you first of all it's quiet just the sounds of the sled runners sliding along the dogs panting and the neckline